Oregon was officially admitted to the Union as a state on February 14, 1859. Just 54 years earlier, Lewis and Clark had made their way through the Oregon Territory. For many years, there had been a flood of settlers coming to Oregon via the Oregon Trail. But now officially becoming a state, more and more people were making their way to Oregon. Most of the people coming to Oregon were looking for a better life. But with an influx of people, you also get murderers, thieves, and your average scumbag. On February 8, 1862, Andrew Pate and George Lamb made their way up the banks of what was called back then Fisher's Creek, also known as Powell Creek by the nearby settlers. Andrew Pate and George Lamb had been riding for most of the day. Andrew had a hidden agenda. He thought George Lamb had $100 on him. That's equivalent to about $2,500 today. As the men made their way up the creek, they stopped. George dismounted from his horse, and Andrew murdered him. After killing George, Andrew took George's body and threw it in the creek. George didn't have the $100 on him. Andrew was later captured. The locals were outraged. Yeah! 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 You're one of my men. They wanted justice. Andrew would later be tried, sentenced, and hung. He would be the first man to be hanged in Lynn County. Not even one year later, eight prospectors who were exploring the banks of the stream were found murdered. The prospectors had set up camp by the stream. They had gone to bed with their heads close under the high rim rock. A band of Native American warriors had found the prospectors. Not happy with their new neighbors, the Native Americans threw rocks, and forced large boulders to fall onto the prospectors while they slept. The natives had killed everyone, except for one man who got away. And as he was fleeing off into the night, the natives had shot arrows into him. His body was later found, along with a note explaining what had happened. Over the years, many people have been murdered and their bodies have been discarded into the creek. Today, the creek is officially called Murderer's Creek. A lot has changed in 161 years. The chances of being murdered and thrown into the creek are very slim today. Even though the landscape looks the same as it did 161 years ago, it's a very different place. Locals today will tell you it's a great place. Couples, individuals, go up there for bird watching. It's a great place to explore local trails and one of the best places to go hunting. Over the last 161 years, there have been many reports of people seeing wild men in this area. Most of the early reports were overshadowed by all of the killing that was going on. Today, it's rare to hear of anyone being murdered up there. But what hasn't changed is there's still many reports of wild men being seen in this area. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me.
they don't make people that that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Cassidy, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles with Wes Kermer, the only man my mother loves more than her own husband. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. A little background, if you're not from Oregon, about Murderer's Creek. It really is a beautiful area. A lot of people go hunting up there, and a lot of hikers, actually, too, as well. And I've had a lot of different reports of Sasquatch in that area. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be chatting with Justin. And Justin's going to be sharing three separate incidences he had at Murderer's Creek. And uh, wait till you hear the behavior of the Sasquatch. Very fascinating stuff. A few things I have not heard before. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Justin to the show. Justin, thanks for coming on. You bet, Wes. Glad to be here, man. Listen to you for a long time. Um, been um, tentative about telling this story for years, but um, I think uh, there's valuable lessons to be learned in these encounters. So I think we our our best uh, our best mo is to share them. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing it. It's uh, it's fascinating. You know, before we went on the air, you and I were talking, and I said, "God, I had another woman contact me." Uh, from that area, and she was talking about her encounter with Murderer's Creek. I hope she comes on the show, but I remember when I was talking to her, I thought, I wonder if she was actually with Justin uh, during this encounter. Uh, but if you would, let's let's walk into what happened to you. Uh, will you tell us kind of what you were doing and, and what happened? So it was uh, the fall of 1996, and uh, at the time, I, I grew up in Bend, Oregon, and um, a buddy of mine and I, we went bow hunting out near John Day. It, we had like a whole week off, so you know we set up a we set up a good camp and and had everything dialed, and uh, we were going to bow hunt mule deer. And I was the only one that had a tag, so my buddy was just kind of along for the ride. He actually grew up in John Day and knew the area well, and and knew you know a lot of people in the area. So, uh, to get into this encounter, um, <clears throat> we'd been hunting for a day or two, I think one evening, my friend's cousin came up from town with his girlfriend and, um, a friend of his and, uh, and that guy's girlfriend too. So that's why I'm not sure who this other person is that, uh, that you referenced. Cause it could have been, um, one of those gals, this was 25 years ago. So, um, I, I don't really remember everybody's name. I, I know, um, you know, my buddy's cousin's name, but, um, anyway, uh, they came up to camp and, uh, and, you know, we made a nice dinner and we were all sitting around the fire telling stories and stuff. And about, uh, 10 o'clock they left and drove back into John day. And, uh, my, my friend and I were just, 
you know, wrapping up camp, doing dishes, getting ready for bed. Um, we had my dog with me. She's a, she was a Brittany, a, a really smart dog, you know, tuned into the woods for sure. Uh, kind of a pain in the butt, kind of one of those dogs. She was a bird hunter, but, uh, you know, you'd take her out and she'd, she'd always get into something, man. She'd been attacked by all sorts of wild animals and, and, uh, you just never knew with her. Sometimes she'd be gone for 36 hours and, and then she'd stumble back into camp or whatever, or back on the river. And, um, anyway, so, uh, we were getting ready to, to climb in the tent and we heard this sound that came from across the logging road up on, uh, the ridge to our North, um, probably only a half a mile away at, at, at most. And it was just this terrifying, you know, scream, howl, change octaves. It, it went on for a long time. And, uh, and, you know, the two of us just stared at each other and, and, uh, my dog was, you know, cowering in the tent, which she never did. And, you know, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a cougar. It wasn't a screech owl. It wasn't any of that stuff. We, I know what all those animals sound like. I spent a lot of time in the woods and, and so as my friend, of course, being a logger and a hunter and, um, yeah, it was just, it was an inexplainable sound. And, uh, so my friend and I, we, we got our, our, uh, we were bow hunting, but you know, we had some shotguns for grouse and stuff. And so we got our shotguns and we, uh, put them in the tent and, uh, we pretty much stayed up till, I don't know, three or four in the morning. Maybe we nodded off. Um, I want to ask you real quick, uh, Justin, what, is there anything you'd compare the, the noise that you heard to, I mean, have you looked online or is there anything you could compare what you heard? You know, I, I, not really. Like I've listened to those Ohio sounds and, and, and stuff. And no, this was just, it was, a, it was really a violent, violent sound. It was, uh, I, I, I can't liken it to anything that's not, you know, it wouldn't be PC of me to even uh, compare it to anything. It was it was a really gnarly, freaky sound. Yeah, I that I've ever heard. Hunters in general know a sound. You know, that's a bobcat. That's a that's a cougar. That's a coyote. That's a fox. Uh, which all those animals make bizarre sounds. So you guys go in the tent. Did you have any idea what it was? I mean, did you guys have any sort of conversation? Yeah, we did. We did. I mean, we definitely, um, you know, came to the conclusion, like, Hey man, I, you know, we grew up out there and, I, you know, we knew fishermen from the coast and we knew, you know, loggers. And, and obviously when you grow up in the Pacific Northwest, you grow up, um, hearing about story, you know, hearing Sasquatch stories. And, and, um, so it, it was something that I, I'd already, I believed in Sasquatch well before this happened, for sure. I knew too many people that had experiences that were legitimate people and um you know had no reason to to lie to anybody about it um so yeah i mean we definitely came to the conclusion like well that could we we ruled everything else uh, else out and um you know i i think we probably came to the conclusion that yeah that was most likely a sasquatch that we just heard scream yeah i don't blame you for loading the shotgun i probably would have too so it's three o'clock you guys nod off what what happens next so uh, really nothing um the rest of that we we stayed there um and finished off our hunt i i believe i killed a deer and uh and that was that was that for uh for for that experience there you know i don't know we it's funny how you know two guys can get to chewing the fat on the road for a couple days and you can kind of rule it all out, right? Like, Oh man, it probably wasn't that it was probably who knows what it was. Maybe it was somebody playing a prank on us out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know, you know, but I don't know. I guess we had kind of over the course of a couple of days convinced ourselves that we didn't need to be scared and we could just kind of do our thing. So that's what we did. I hear you. And I know you had two other encounters. Was it in the same area? Same camp. So, um, the following spring, um, the girl that I was dating at the time, and this was in my early, early twenties, I think I was 21. I'm 45 now. So she came with us and it was my same friend, Joe and, and her and, and I, and, uh, and we just went out there to go, you know, kind of 
scratch the cabin fever off. And it was a nice like April or May weekend in central Oregon. So we were going to go camp and uh, go poke around in the woods for a couple of days. It's funny because uh, the same guy and my my buddy's cousin from John Day and uh, and his girlfriend came up uh, again for dinner one night, maybe the second or third night in camp or something, and um, just kind of like the the same story all over again. They uh, you know stayed, had dinner. My my girlfriend actually was asleep. She slept through everything. She was tired and had been, you know, in the tent sleeping since probably three or four in the afternoon. So the rest of us were up and having dinner and chatting around the campfire. And then, uh, those guys took off and headed back into John day. And, uh, my girlfriend got up to help me do the dishes and clean up camp and everything. And, and, uh, my, my friend, uh, went and walked outside of camp, uh, to go relieve himself. And we heard him empty his handgun. He had a, a 22 revolver and it, like he fanned it. Like it was, you know, I mean, you've fanned a revolver before and like, bam, 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 bam. I'm like, whoa, why, why is Joe fanning his revolver? So he comes back into camp. He's like, Hey, this big animal just jumped out of the Creek bed and it's running across the road right now. And my girlfriend who grew up on the coast. Um, and when she was a little girl, she had had a kind of a, weird experience in the woods herself. But, um, anyway, she ran out to the road and I grabbed, um, I had a, a really bright, you know, light in my truck, like a, you know, little spotlight thing that we always used for finding camp spots and, you know, getting people back out of the woods. Oftentimes we'd shoot an elk or whatever late in the afternoon and be in some dark Canyon. And this is before GPSs and stuff kind of. So, you know, you'd go find people, um, and, and get them back, back to camp sometimes just based on the power of a spotlight. So I, I grabbed the spotlight and plug it in and, uh, and I, we get the animal in the, in the light. And I mean, that's bright as day. It, it, it just cleared the road when I got it and it ran up on the hillside and it was just paralleling our camp just running so fast across this hillside, this, you know, sparsely, I don't know. I mean, I'd call it sparsely timbered. It had been thinned out a little bit and it was just moving so quickly. And it, it, you know, it rarely took its eyes off of us, which is really crazy to be able to move that fast through the woods and not even watch where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. that's what it did. That's what it did, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was unbelievable how 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 quick that thing moved through the woods. Can you kind of describe what you saw? So, I mean, when I first got it in the spotlight, and uh, I should tell you that uh, my girlfriend came back into camp and said that it was whistling at her. Um. So then she's with me, and we're all, and then Joe's there. We're all watching it run across the hillside. You know, it just, it, I guess it looked like, uh, like, a Olympic athlete in, um, all, I don't know, a dark suit, all black spandex or something. Um, it, it, its eyes were reflective, but they looked just like, uh, the reflective eyes of an elk or a deer or a rabbit or something. They weren't red or, you know, any other, any other color, really. They were just reflective. And yeah, it just, it, it moved so fast and with such agility and was, you know, I've been up on that hillside. We went up there the next morning and I'd walked that hillside before, but just went to go kind of follow the path that it took. Oh, there's stumps and rocks and all sorts of shit in there. <laughs> Excuse my French, but like how an animal could move that fast um, in that kind of terrain and not even really ever take its eyes off of us. It's just mind blowing. I even, I, I don't know, man. It was, it, it was unbelievable the way the thing moved. Yeah. No, they, they are, they, they have a weird way of moving. It was it on two legs the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my buddy, when he said it jumped out of the crick bed, um, you know, I, I can't say that it, he said it was upright, right. It was right in front of him, very close. 
but yeah, he said it was on two legs right out of the gate, and it was always on two legs when we saw it. And let me ask you, Justin, so when you hit it with the light, how far, I realize it's paralleling and kind of running, and you're trying to ca- capture it with the spotlight. How far away from you was it? Uh, probably 200 yards. Jeez. I'm surprised you guys went up to follow it. The ne- What was it, the next day, you said? You went up there to see where it was running? Yeah. In the morning, we, we found a single track uh, right where Joe had encountered it in the creek bed. I laid down my Leatherman tool. It was uh, 10 inches long and six inches wide, and it was just the front part of the foot. So it had jumped up this embankment, but it was you know embedded in the clay soil about a quarter inch or so. And I weigh over 200, and I was jumping up and down with my heel, and I couldn't even make an indentation in that in that um, soil in the substrate. And, um, I don't know, like, it, I guess it, originally I thought that maybe, um, the way it had jumped, it just used the front part of it, uh, of its foot. Like, you know, you or I would, if we were going to jump up a, a steep embankment, I don't know, I guess having read more on the subject than everything, it could have been, um, just the fact that it had a, it was exhibiting a mid tarsal break. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a fascinating account, especially whistling at your girlfriend. Um, yeah, and then Joe, did you guys? Did any was anyone able to kind of see its face? No, maybe. Um, no, I mean maybe my my ex girlfriend kind of did. She got pretty close to it, um, but uh, we never had that conversation. And yeah, I haven't talked to her in a long time. Yeah, no, I hear you. Plus, you're hitting it with the spotlight, so um, I mean, you mentioned the eyes reflecting. Uh, that, that's spooky, man. I mean, what, what was going through your head when, a, after that experience, I mean, did anyone sleep that night or was it pretty much everyone was up all night? Yeah, everyone was up all night that night for sure. Um, my, my dog, the same dog was with us. Um, and we all just kind of huddled up in the tent. There was some talk of maybe we should get out of there. Um, but we didn't, we wrote it out. You know, I, if, if I'd have been there alone i definitely would have left but when you have uh, a couple other people with you uh, you know i guess uh i guess we figured we were okay so yeah that watching them move is it almost looks i don't know if this is the right word to use but i've used it before it almost looks fake when you see how they move it's almost like am i really seeing this because it's so quick and you're right i mean if it's keeping its eyes on you guys the whole time and it's running at full speed. It's shocking that they don't trip, fall, stumble. Uh, it seems almost yeah. impossible, don't you think? Yeah, it is impossible. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it really puts things into perspective uh, how gangly and weak we are out there walking around in the woods as humans. Yeah, no doubt. Did anything else happen on that trip? I mean, after it, so it leaves, you guys go, you guys find tracks. Did anything else happen on that trip? Nope, not on that trip. And I, I think we left uh, the next day. I got um, you. Yeah. Um, just, but I, I, I believe that the weekend was over. I don't know that we, um, I mean, we were definitely scared, you know, um, and, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, being 21, are you really afraid of anything? Like if that happened to me now, I'd be like, yeah, we are out of here. Yeah. But uh, uh, I guess, you know, youthful exuberance and um, safety in numbers. So no, nothing else happened on that trip. Um, however, the following fall, we went back to the same camp, my friend Joe and I, and, uh, and three of our buddies joined us. So there's five of us in camp. Opening day, it was super hot that year opening day of uh archery i i shot a buck and uh it was you know mid 90s so uh, we we got it back to camp as quickly as we could and i just started butchering it right away so i could get all the meat on ice and in the cooler and uh so i cut it all up and then i took the carcass and that year the the meat bees the yellow jackets were unbelievable unreal how many there were i've never seen anything like it so the yellow jackets were swarming me while i'm cutting it i don't know how many times i got stung a lot so i took the carcass across the creek and i hung it up in this little grove of trees and uh, i roped it up and i i slung it probably 
I mean, it was out of my reach. So, you know, I don't know, nine feet off the ground. And, uh, and we went back, uh, that evening, we, you know, had some dinner and we we're kicking around and same kind of time of night, like right after 10 o'clock, right when we're kind of winding down, we hear this animal walk. We hear these footfalls coming down the hill across from us, other side. So, um, this is, uh, not across the logging road that's to our North, but it's in the timber it's to the south of us. And that timbered face goes all the way for miles and miles and miles back there into the Murderer's Creek unit. We hear these footfalls. We hear uh, this animal in the grove. He finds the carcass. We're all sitting there listening to it. It's making some odd sounds, you know, grunts and snorts and like, oh God. And so, it, it, you know, our friends that a few of our close friends, we had shared our experience with. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know how it is. Like, People aren't going to believe you until they actually see something or um, at any rate. Uh, so our friends are all just sitting there like, oh, my God, is this really happening? Like, this is actually there's actually a freaking Sasquatch in our camp right now. Like, this is insane. Are these guys? I don't know. It's, I, they were just like, whoa. And so uh, we unloaded some guns in the air. And it wasn't easy to scare it off. It didn't run away like, you know, after the first salvo. It, it took uh, uh, several rounds for it to, to run off, but we could hear it run off. And so then we all went over, we crossed the creek, single file, you know, shotguns, flashlights in hand, and went over there and the carcass was on the ground. So we hung it up higher up the tree, like higher up between the grove of trees. So it was man, 11 or 12 feet off the ground, probably. And we went back to camp and not five minutes later, that thing ran back down there and it, it got it out of the tree again. And we scared it off a second time and we went back over there and then we hung it as high as we possibly could. And we went back to camp and it came down and it got it again. And that time we just sat there and, and listened to it and uh, it just did its thing. And I don't know how long we listened to it a while. And then it took off. It just walked off. And then the, the next, well, one of our buddies got in his truck and left and um, moved to Alaska. And I've not even spoken to him since. He was a good, close friend of ours. So did it eat the whole carcass or did you guys go back and check it the next morning? In the morning, we went and checked it. The, the thing that stood out was, um, it, you know, most of the meat had all been, obviously, I'd cut most of the meat off all the bones the, the scraps and stuff were still there the stuff you can't get off with a fillet knife but what struck me was um the rib meat was all pulled away the the meat in between the ribs which is really like you could never in a million there's not a man on earth that could pull that out of there and that was all stripped away and it looked like somebody took a fillet knife and went in there and and, and cut it all out but it was it pulled that rib meat, which is the the grip strength to do that. It's it's crazy, man. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's hard to get it out with the knife. <laughs> you it know is. what I mean? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that yeah, that's it's strange, crazy. Man. What what um why why do you think I mean, so I'm trying to figure out what what's kind of going through your guys' heads. You know, when you're young though, it's different. I think if I was twenty one, I probably would have done the same thing you guys did. Uh, now you'd never i had been like it can have it you know i'd leave i would just let it have it but what made you kind of keep going back and hanging it higher um just wanting the elk and hoping this thing would scare off well no i mean the deer was the deer was butchered it was just the carcass um i think we were just trying to scare it away so it would leave us alone oh i got you I got you. So it was just a carcass. You guys had already, you'd packed the meat away. No, I, all, all the meat was in the cooler. Yeah, I got it was you. just a carcass. No, it, we were just trying to scare the thing off yeah. so, it wouldn't, so it wouldn't attack us. Yeah, it's strange though, you know, firing off shots. I, and I've said it before, I don't think gunfire scares these things off. I really don't oh, think. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I don't think it bothers them as much as people think. Um, well, it sure didn't bother that one, man. It was not, it wasn't, it, I yeah, it didn't seem to scare it at all. It just got bored with it, I think. I don't know. The The creepy part is, you know, it was sitting there watching you. It didn't really scare off. It probably oh, sat sure. and watched you guys rehang it 
wait for you guys to leave and then went back to grab it. That's a spooky part. You know? uh, absolutely. It did for sure. Yep. That is the spooky part. What was some of the noises you were hearing? Oh man. It was just like deep gut, like almost like, um, like a big, like if you ever heard like a wild boar pig eat like a carcass or something. And it makes like all those weird grunts and kind of, squeals and i i don't know that's as close as i could connect it to anything i mean obviously it's not like anything we've ever heard before but um yeah it was weird i mean grunting and snorting and, and i don't know like if that was its sound of feeding or if it was like trying to intimidate us or what who knows yeah it's like a fat guy at a buffet man <laughs> yeah, there you go that's what it sounded like yeah it sounded like yeah yeah, fat guy at Golden Corral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, was the gut pile in that same area and did it take it? Or uh, I'm just kind of curious about the gut pile. No, the gut pile was uh, up in the mountains. I uh, I gutted the deer when I shot it and then um, and then brought, you know, all the meat and everything into camp. Yeah. I, I would imagine, especially being 90 degrees, man, you got to. You got to move fast oh, on yeah. something like that. Gotta move. Yeah, got to move quickly. Do you think it was watching you guys? Do you think it watched you guys take down? I know it's speculation and obviously sure. you don't know either way, but it really makes me wonder if it watched you kill that deer and then had been sitting watching you the whole time. No, because I shot the deer miles and miles away from camp um, in you know the heat of the day. Um, so I, I guess my take on it now is that there were so many deer up and down that road in those, in those years that I I think that those, there were Sasquatches hunting them off the road at night, you know, then maybe it had picked us out as a a camp that had some deer and um, was just kind of looking for an easy meal. I mean, that's the, right. That's the, uh, yeah, there are opportunities. That's, that's the most, uh, yeah, that's the most uh, natural, um, easiest conclusion yeah did you guys ever did you ever go back to that after this last experience you ever go back to that area never never been back there man i don't blame you i I don't blame you you know i mean i i I would um i would i mean i wouldn't go probably camp there at night but I'd, i'd like to go put eyes on it in in the daytime and see what it looks like um but yeah, I'd like to go back to that spot. So I'd love to go back with my, my friends that I was with. I'd love to go back there with, with, uh, my buddy Joe and, um, and, uh, just go put eyes on it and kind of, you know, put all the pieces back together in your mind, just location wise. Yeah. It, the, the other part that fascinates me is it didn't really seem to shake you up too much. You know, a lot of times when hunters run in and have experience and run-ins with these creatures, uh, a lot of times they quit hunting. Um, Do you think maybe it was just being young or why do you think it didn't really shake you up a whole lot? Well, it did shake me up. Um, I I didn't quit hunting. I quit, you know, I used to, I used to shoot like gophers and rabbits and coyotes and stuff. And, and um, I, I've never, um, shot any of those animals ever since I've, I've had that experience. And now I only just hunt what I'm going to eat. So it totally shifted my psyche and, in, in, in the way that I look at uh, the natural world and the way that I, uh, um, approach, uh, you know, nature and the way that I hunt. So it definitely shook me up in a good way though, in, in a positive way. Um, you know, I, I mean, I mean to each his own, but I, you know, for me, I, I, I guess, what I took away from it was that um, maybe I was doing something wrong and maybe the guardian of the forest paid me a visit and kind of, you know, knocked me on the head and said, Hey, cut it out. So that's what I took away from it. Mm. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. It's uh, it really is a fascinating account though. And I've been getting a lot of reports from that area, you know, that, uh, that murderer's Creek, what they call it? The howler at murderer's Creek, I think is what, uh, if you look it up online, and I've done some research. There's definitely a lot of accounts there. What do you think that they are, Justin? What What do you think this creature is? Well, I guess I, like I said, I think it's the guardian of the forest. Um, I don't know, um, you know, from a 
physiological standpoint, uh, is it is it an ape? Is it a Gigantopithecus? I've read Krantz's books. I've read all that stuff. Um, um, you know, I I don't know um, on that front. I, I it'd be pure speculation. And um, you know, I think kind of like you, I I've kind of gravitated towards uh, believing that there's more to this than just um, than just flesh and bone. You know, and I, I mean for me. It, it impacted me in a way that changed the way that I, uh, that I do a lot of things. So, you know, if I would have seen a chimpanzee in Florida and out in the wild, I, I don't think I would have probably <laughs> altered my behavior the way that this thing impacted me. So yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. I mean, and you can kind of see it from your own encounter, you know, the, the last encounter that you had, it's obviously physical. It wanted to meet and it was going after it like, a like a kid you take a toy away from or something. It just was relentless on getting it. But then right. on the second time you guys saw it, I mean, you saw how it moved and how it never took its eyes off of you. And it's running at such a speed and they don't mess up. They don't trip. They don't fall. And that seems impossible to me. You know, it's, and I hear right. it a lot. I mean, you hear about the way these things jump across roads and you're like, right. I, that seems pretty impossible, but you hear it a lot. One question I want to ask you, going back to that second encounter. So when it took off running, it didn't necessarily like flee like a normal animal. It ran parallel, you said, and it and it, it kept. It did. Yeah, it did. Why, it, uh... why, why do you think it did that? Why do you think it ran parallel? Because you know most animals will, when they flee, they flee. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe it, uh, maybe it didn't want to take its eyes off of us. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, yeah, it's strange. I know it's all yeah, speculation. I, I, I don't, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I haven't ever really thought of that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why it did, it did what it did. Um, yeah. And it was really weird that it whistled at my, my girlfriend like that. It, uh, yeah, crazy. I didn't hear that. And I, Joe didn't hear that either, but she sure heard it. Yeah. It's bizarre, man. It's bizarre. I really appreciate you, you sharing it. It's, it's, um, you know, you hear about them whistling and you can listen to recordings of them whistling and, you know, for it to whistle at your girlfriend, you know, we as humans, we'd probably look at that differently than what they're, you know, what, whatever they're trying to communicate. Um, right. the fact that it didn't scream or roar or anything, how it did that weird whistle at your girlfriend. It's bizarre, man. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I mean, it was really close to us and it had been watching us obviously for a while um, before, you know, my buddy went over and just happened to take a leak right next to it and it jumped out of the creek. But it was, it had to have been hunkered down listening to us the whole time for who knows how long. But, you know, I mean, what was that? What was that about? Was it, was it just waiting for, um, to pick up some scraps or like, well, I don't know, man, it's creepy. Yeah, it definitely is. I know your wife has a podcast. What's the name of the podcast? Oh yeah. Um, hers is called the February room. And, uh, that's a reflection of, uh, um, we live in Montana in the winter time. Uh, we all hunker down in our February rooms or man caves or dens or whatever you want to call it. And, <laughs> tell stories and swap fly patterns and, you know, talk about fishing and hunting and stuff. So that's why it's called the February room. Um, but she interviews, um, anglers and, and fly, you know, fly fishermen and people in the industry and, uh, get some really cool characters on there. So yeah, she's only been doing it for a little while. We're about 20 episodes in, but, uh, yeah, she loves it and puts a lot of time into it and she's a really good editor and it's, uh, it's, it's fun, man. It's cool. It's a, such a neat platform. We've listened to yours for years and years. Um, you know, we, my buddies that I elk hunt with, we go into some pretty deep country in a wall tent and there's no cell service or anything like that. So I just download a bunch of Sasquatch Chronicles before I head into camp. And uh, you put us to bed every night, man. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you listening very much. I hope everyone out there goes and checks out the February room. Justin's wife does it. I'll throw up a link to as well, Justin. And uh, after all these years, man, I appreciate you taking the time to come on and share what happened to you. Awesome, Wes. It's a pleasure talking to you, man. Keep up the 
keep up the strong work. Thanks, ma'am. All right. Good luck. Hopefully we'll see each other one of these days. I'll probably go to Kennewick when that thing gets back on track here. Oh, yeah. The International Bigfoot Conference. I think it's going to be going on next year. Uh, Hope to see you up there. You bet, man. Take care of yourself. Thanks again, Justin. And that's it for tonight. Everyone, remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at Sasquatch Chronicles.